and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, the accuser which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out unto the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Well, he trained kids for years in self-defense. Now a martial arts instructor is defending himself in court, accused of sexually assaulting a student. Chinese black magic. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Are you still serious about this? And uh, monsters and ghosts as well, I suppose. Oh, sure. And sorcery. And I suppose that uh, you expect me to believe in sorcery as well. Of course. Why? Because it's real. How can I know that, Mr. Shen? Well, how? Yes, how? Help me out here, please. Ha. Huh. See? That was nothing. But that's how it always begins. Very small. The floodgates of Eastern mysticism and New Age thought were opened in the West through cinema and literature focused on a generation searching for its identity. With the Cultural Revolution, Woodstock and the Beatles, martial arts, yoga, and the introduction of transcendental meditation found a growing acceptance among baby boomers. Television shows and films such as David Carradine's Kung Fu, The Green Hornet, Billy Jack, and Bruce Lee's Epic brought the mystical powers of the martial arts into the homes and lives of millions of Americans. And a country, once historically Christian in background and belief, began to flirt with the ideologies of the Far East. And little did we realize the price we would pay for stepping on to this enchanted ground. During the 1970s and 80s, martial arts became mainstream. With the introduction of full contact karate and kickboxing to the public, the martial arts were now being promoted not only as self-defense, but as a sport, as health and fitness, and even as a family activity. Martial arts, Tai Chi, and yoga classes began springing up in YMCAs and health clubs across the U.S. And Hollywood and the printed page brought secrets of the Far East within reach of the imaginations of millions of Americans, while promising them discipline, self-confidence, self-control and self-esteem. During the 1990s, Chinese masters with their internal arts of Tai Chi, Ba Gua, Xing Yi, and Qi Gong began publishing books which revealed the methods of attaining these once secret abilities of the martial art legends. And there is now a growing interest in the spiritual powers and practices of these men of the East. Even many celebrities and politicians have revealed their active participation in these and other mystical Eastern arts. Today, the martial arts, seductively blended with metaphysics and psychology, has begun to take on a more scientific facade. Once traditionally secret arts are now being taught as the means to achieve not only personal protection, but self-healing, self-awareness, and emotional regeneration. Self-empowerment has become the god of this age. A web of Eastern philosophy and mysticism is being spread in an ever-increasing attempt
to capture the hearts and minds of this last generation. Through Hollywood, the film and entertainment industry is weaving an illusion of the martial arts being both scientific as well as spiritual. And it is this blend of science and spiritism which will prove to be the final omega of apostasy which was foretold by the apostles of Jesus Christ. I put the force into the movies in order to try to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young people. Uh, more a belief in God than a belief in any particular uh, you know, religious system. I mean, the, the, the real question is to ask the question. Because if you, if you haven't enough interest in the mysteries of life to ask the questions, is, is there a God or is there not a God? Um, uh, that's, that's, for me, the worst thing that can happen. You know, if you ask a young person, is there a God, and they say, I don't know. You know, I, I think you should have an opinion about that. The question must be asked, a belief in what God? Who hath ascended up into heaven, or descended down from above? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name, and what is his son's name, if thou canst tell? And what is this mystery which Lucas and others are spending billions to introduce to the youth of our generation? Let no man deceive you by any means, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. According to the Chinese classic, the Tao Te Ching, the Tao is like a well, used but never used up. It is like the eternal void filled with infinite possibilities. It is hidden but always present. The Tao doesn't take sides. It gives birth both to good and evil. The Tao is called the Great Mother, empty yet inexhaustible. It gives birth to infinite worlds. It is always present within you, and you can use it any way you want. This spiritual energy called the Tao, or universal life force, is symbolized by the mystical figure of the yin and yang, and it is through this merging of light with darkness, these two opposite yet supposedly equal powers, that harmony and the Tao is manifest, and spiritual gifts and abilities are said to be achieved. This description is identical to that of the power used by the Jedi and Sith warriors in the Star Wars film series. This very same power is also called by them the Force, and it is this force of light and darkness, of good and evil, which Lucifer claims to be. It is this spirit and power which has been worshipped by every occult and pagan religion since the dawn of time. Albert Pike, the author of Morals and Dogma, states this belief in unmistakable terms. Yes, Lucifer is God, and unfortunately, Adonai, or the Lord Jesus, is also God. For the eternal law is that there is no light without shade, no beauty without ugliness, no white without black. For the absolute can only exist as two gods, darkness being necessary to light. Simply put, pure philosophic religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai, but Lucifer God of light and God of good is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. For if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! According to both Asian and occult philosophy, this force or energy is said to dwell within all matter the rocks, the trees, the planets, animals, and every human being. And although hidden, it is said to be only awaiting to be awakened, an awakening which is achieved through the practice of Eastern meditation, breathing techniques, mantra chanting, visualization, hypnosis, and countless other occult practices. It is this spiritual energy which all Eastern religions credit as the true source of their power. Although this mysterious power is called by different names in every culture, its principles and manifestations are always the same. For what is known as Qi by the ancient Chinese is called Qi in the Japanese art of Aikido. 
while to the Hindu, this same power is known as prana. To the Polynesian people, it is called mana, or mana, energy. And by many New Age practitioners in the West, this spiritual power is called oregon, vibrational or subtle energy. And this same spiritual energy today is being used and promoted by New Age gurus worldwide. To martial artists across the world, the cultivation, control, and demonstration of this energy is considered the highest and most sought after ability. Chi is said to be manifest through harmonizing both positive and negative forces of the universe within the human body. This energy is then demonstrated by martial artists in countless ways. Stone, brick, or board breaking, iron body exhibitions, performing seemingly impossible feats of acrobatic skill, withstanding extremes of temperature, exhibiting superhuman strength, speed, and explosive power. And this same mysterious energy, which is used by disciples and masters of these combative arts, is also demonstrated by Qigong and Reiki practitioners, by acupuncturists, acupressurists, Tai Chi masters, yoga gurus, and New Age holistic healers. To many, this power is called the God Spark, or Cosmic Consciousness. But regardless of its name, this esoteric power is from one and the same source, that old serpent, the devil. In the philosophy of yin and yang, nothing is of itself considered to be inherently evil or wrong. Everything is said to be good so long as it is used to maintain balance of the Tao and the greater good of the universe. This then is the martial arts most subtle deception, for according to this philosophy, that which is called God owes its very existence to the joining of light with darkness. But the word of the Lord assures us that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. In this pagan philosophy, there are no absolutes, or as Aleister Crowley stated, do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And this poor man, who was a legend and an icon in the music and film industry, spent the final hours of his life in a state of hopelessness, dread, and fear. In these teachings, truth becomes merely the point of one's own perspective. And the serpent's whisper, hath God really said? can be as verily heard today as it was so long ago, and the shadow of doubt is cast upon Jehovah's holy word. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, to the law and to the testimony of his spirit. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The symbols of the tiger and dragon are as ancient as the martial arts itself and familiar to all styles. They are synonymous with the yin and yang of Eastern mysticism and philosophy. But what few understand is the role which these two symbols play and the spiritual significance which is revealed when joining them as one. While the tiger represents man's physical strength and power, the earthly, carnal, and unregenerate heart, man's will to conquer, it is the dragon which stands as the symbol of the prince of the powers of the air, those principalities and powers of darkness which now worketh in the children of disobedience. It is this spirit of the dragon which the masters of the martial arts hold in such reverence and awe, and it is this power which is sought above all others. While most Western instructors will emphatically deny any involvement with the occult religions of the East, when we watch the practices of these men and women and compare their arts and the fruits thereof with the Word of God, there are serious questions which arise. It's working. This training is hard training. It develops your mental faculties. It turns into warrior and killer instinct. We develop him as a warrior. Shout Kali! Kali! It is common for these teachers to say that they are able to divorce the physical arts from their spiritual roots. But according to high-level martial artists and masters, this is a great deception. When one looks closely at the religious background of a style's founder, 
you will discern the spirit which inspired or inspirited that style and which influences its forms, techniques, and methods of training. The very spiritual DNA of a martial style can never be separated or severed from its practice. For out of the heart the mouth speaks, and through physical actions the spirit is manifest. The word of Almighty God says, By their fruits ye shall know them. For how can two walk together except they be agreed? Our very actions bear witness to the powers or God which we live for, serve, and obey. A Christian instructor joined to a pagan style is spiritual adultery, unfaithfulness, and apostasy. I'm 100% Jesus. God can see my heart. People misunderstood, think, oh, how a Christian can fight in the name. Spinning power! Oh, and now Brito goes for the triangle choke! Yeah, for sure, a Christian can fight in MMA, a Christian can go to a war, a Christian can go... We Christians, we're not different, we're just Christians. And I don't see nothing wrong with that. But do these thoughts agree with the word of the living God? And if this is correct, then why does the Lord tell us through his apostle John that he which saith he abideth in Christ ought himself also so to walk and live even as Jesus lived? They call themselves warriors, literally fighting the good fight of faith. Never mind that the Gospel of Matthew quotes Jesus as saying, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also, because tonight you're going to meet a group of Christians who say that by striking an opponent, well, they're striking a blow for the Lord. Ryan Owens has an encore presentation from our series, Faith Matters. Fight breaks out. But this isn't your grandfather's bar fight. Hurt like hell, but yeah. <laughs> and then as soon as I tape you, let's pray. Yeah. And some of these fighters give Bible beaters. Father, we just uh, thank you for the opportunity to go out tonight and to train and compete. And A whole new meaning. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. As Christians, there are times where you take shots. That's where the Bible gives you your training. I get all the time, I don't look like the typical pastor, and that's okay. Um, there's actually a cool verse in the Bible that says, be weary when all men speak well of you. <laughs> if everybody loves you, you're doing something wrong. But God, you have called us to a fight. When Preston came up with the idea of having a fight club in the church, it was an easy thing to say yes to. <laughs> Tough guys need Jesus too. You guys like to see me fight another pastor? We'll just be a couple of God-fearing men punching each other in the face. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pastor versus Pastor. Tonight, we got to fight. And then we'll talk about Jesus tomorrow when we go to church. How many are yet walking in darkness, not realizing the high calling upon their lives in Christ Jesus? And this ain't love. At the end of the day, it's about reaching people with the gospel, regardless of what you need to do to introduce them into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Punch, punch, punch to the face. Now go for the jump right there. For he has promised us that an elder must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, not self-willed, not soon to anger, but a lover of good men, just, holy, and temperate in all things. An elder must not be given to wine, not a striker, but patient, and not a brawler, holding fast the faithful word, so that he may be able by sound doctrine and instruction to exhort and convince the gainsayers. But the question is often asked, what about self-defense? And what about the physical training methods of these arts? Can I not be a Christian and yet still train in these arts without their spiritual influences? It is through actions repeated that habits are formed, habits which form our character, and it is by character that our destiny for time and eternity is decided. If we are practicing daily to block and counter, 
What will become our natural response when meeting confrontation or opposition? And what is the character which these arts impart to their students? When pure knuckles meet pure flesh, that's pure karate, no matter who executes it or whatever style is involved. When two tigers fight, one is certain to be maimed and one to die. Jiu-Jitsu is the gentle art. It is the art where a small man is going to prove to you, no matter how strong you are, no matter how mad you get, that you're going to have to accept defeat. That's what Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is. If we fight for money, I'll stop hitting you when you ask me to. If we fight for honor, I'll stop hitting you when I feel like it. The heart of karate is real fighting. There can be no proof without real fighting. Better to be a tiger for a day than a sheep for a lifetime. Many parents enroll their children in the martial arts with the hopes of them learning self-defense, self-control, and discipline. But is this the reality of these practices? Do the training and teachings of these Eastern arts really lead to greater obedience and submission to a parent's instruction in the Word of God? Do students of these arts typically grow closer in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ as they progress in rank? Or do we see another character being formed, one of pride, of independence, and rebellion to authority? For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow in his steps. He who did no sin, neither was guile and deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, he reviled and retaliated not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself unto the judgment of him that judgeth righteously. Dearly beloved, I say, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him to drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and his conscience shall be burnt. Therefore, be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The martial arts are being marketed today as a family activity. But the tradition behind this idea would shock most students and parents if they were told the truth when they joined. Traditional Asian martial arts styles were based on family or clan secrets of warfare. These secrets were not allowed to be spoken of or shared outside the dojo or home of the master. We will look at one such legendary founder of the arts so that you may see and understand the spiritual influences which are working behind the scenes. The man's name is Tsatsu Shimabuku. He is the founder of Ishinru Karate. It was during a vision given him in the 1950s that Shimabuku saw the principles of his art revealed, and under the inspiration of the goddess Magami, he founded his style of karate. By the direct instruction of this spirit, the Okinawan master drew a picture of what he had seen in his vision which later was duplicated as the logo and symbol of the Ishinru style. And under the oversight of one of his disciples, the artwork took form. And the symbol of his art can now be seen adorning tens of thousands of karate uniforms and dojos worldwide. Look closely at the figures represented in the emblem of his art. The woman is an unnatural blending or amalgamation of the human female and a serpent. Above her right shoulder is the image of a great red dragon and three prominent stars. The female image is shown rising up out of the abyss and seated upon the stormy seas. The symbolism is too exact to be mere coincidence. Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the woman which thou sawest 
is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The original title given by the founder for this symbol was Ishinru no Magami, or the goddess of Ishinru. Magami, Mei, means woman. Kami, or Gami, is the Japanese word for Shinto deity or god. Ishinru, Ish, or Ichi, means one, chief, or first. Shin means spirit or heart. Ru means Tatsu, dragon or way, the goddess of the first spirit dragon. Even the name of the founder, Tatsu Shimabuku, was symbolic of the style's ultimate goals and purpose. Tatsu literally means in Japanese, the dragon man. He was given this title in honor of his enlightenment and recognition by the pagan gods in the founding of this art. To him and the initiated few, the final revelation of Ishinru Karate is the way or path of uniting as one the spirit of the dragon and man. And Shimabuku's art is not the only style which reveals its true spiritual intent. Aikido, the way of harmonizing with spirit. Hapkido, the path or way of unity with spirit. Jingyi Quan, mind, will, and form boxing. Bagua Zhang, eight triagram or divination palms. In each of these martial arts, real power is obtained only by the transfer of spiritual energy. For it is through the inspiration of the masters, gurus, and teachers, which is passed down to their disciples, that the dragon is working to bring about his last great deception. And it is through these countless millions of men, women, and innocent children which strive in their training to imitate the role of their instructor that an image is truly being formed. Either we are being daily transformed by the renewing of our minds into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, or we are being slowly conformed and molded into the image of this world and its first rebel leader. Have you ever wondered why so many dojos and martial studios require students to remove their shoes when entering the school or stepping onto the training floor? Is it possible that these practices reveal a deeper spiritual significance than many have been led to believe? And the Lord God said unto Moses, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Are these schools being used as the grounds upon which to worship Eastern pagan deities? Look at their very names in the Asian languages and let us listen to their own response. Dojo, a place of the way. Dao Zhang, the place of enlightenment. Traditionally, the dojo is considered sacred ground with its own special etiquette. To begin, every student submits unquestionably to their teacher. Submission is often represented symbolically by the simple ceremony of bowing to the teacher. Whatever the floor is made of, be it cement, carpet, or an expensive mat, the way I present my answer when the student asks, why do we take off our shoes, is that the student removes his shoes to yield to the instructor's right to lead. The instructor removes his shoes because he too yields to a higher power. The dojo is a destination. It is a place to go. It is sacred ground. No one ends up in a dojo by mistake. For many of us, it is like coming home. We bow to the front, the showman, in honor of our ancestral heritage. Then we bow to the sensei or master, as a gesture of respect for the teacher. In addition to being a teacher of karate techniques, the sensei is a guide, a guide to illuminate the path and lead the way for the student. The sensei is the guiding light because the sensei serves such an important role in shaping a student's development. Physically, mentally, and spiritually, the sensei must possess outstanding qualifications and abilities. 
The titles of sensei and sifu are Asian in origin. They refer to a teacher who has dedicated his life to instructing his pupils in the martial way. But the Lord Jesus Christ tells us, Be not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and ye are all brethren. And call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven, and neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. For he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. For whosoever shall exalt himself shall be cast down, but those that humble themselves shall be exalted. Is not this the very character which is seen in the martial arts, that of pride and self-exaltation? The spirit that I saw when I accepted Jesus into my heart was different. That spirit was one of love, it was one of peace. The spirit that I received from the masters, and I trained under some of the best in the world, uh, that spirit was one of violence, it was different, it was one of control, it was one of mastery over another person. It wasn't the same spirit in the Lord that I could love that person for who they were, not for what I knew and what I demanded of them. So and that really is the attitude of many people within the martial arts. They lord it over those who are under them. It becomes a superiority problem. It becomes a an issue that they want control. They do have control over you in some sense uh, of control and they want to emulate their instructor and they want to give they want to give that person something that they receive so it's a spirit that is passed down from generation to generation and each succeeding generation uh, either becomes stronger or they quit one or the other they're all looking for that power power over people the power of violence and they want to emulate that power in such a way that that people will fear them, and it's the fear factor that most people don't understand. And is this not the very character of Satan before the fall from his exalted position in heaven? Oh, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning star? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend, I will exalt my throne, I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, I will be like the Most High. Then we look and see the Son of Almighty God as He humbles Himself and takes on the form of a servant, that of a mere man. And we see Him as He battles with all the desires of our fallen nature within His own human flesh. And as He cries out for victory and strength in the Garden of Gethsemane, and He fell on His face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father! If thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And the same Lord and Sovereign King, who sweat great drops of blood there in the garden, fighting for you and I, is the same who spoke from the heights of Sinai, with words which shook the earth like thunder. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve and obey them. Even on the most basic level, the practice of the martial arts contradicts not only the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also the very clear instructions of His written word. The Lord God, Jehovah, Yahweh Elohim tells us that we are not to bow in humility, in obedience, nor in service to anyone in place of our Creator. For when man chooses to serve and obey another, he is verily committing idolatry as if a statue were standing right before him. The bow-in ceremony is based on a Shinto ritual banishing evil spirits and inviting the presence of the gods. However, in the context of training, students may think of this ritual as banishing their own personal demons, cleansing the mind of negative or distracting thoughts, and preparing for training. They may envision summoning their best selves to rise to the challenges of training and extract the maximum benefit and understanding from the teachings they are about to receive. 
The words spoken during the bow-in and bow-out ceremony can be translated as, in every moment, another chance for enlightenment. Bowing to others is not about a sign of submission, but about recognizing the spark of divinity in another fellow human being. Bowing is one of the most humble and spiritual acts a human can perform. It is an action that simultaneously signifies acceptance and a deep understanding of and feeling toward its object. Moreover, through this action, we cast aside the narrow confines of the self and we accept the energy of the universe. By bowing, we are giving up ourselves to the universe. To give up ourselves means to give up our dualistic ideas and become one. When you become one with everything that exists, you find the true meaning of being. As we listen to these words, are we not once again hearing the whispers of the serpent in Eden, which said, Ye shall not surely die, but ye shall be as gods. But thus saith the Lord God Almighty, I have yet reserved unto myself a remnant in Israel, which have not bowed their knee to bow. For sin is the faithless transgression of my law. And verily I say unto you, Whosoever continueth in sin is the slave of sin, and the wages of sin is death. A diligent study will reveal the true spiritual influences which these masters receive for their styles, often while in a trance or a deep meditation and worshiping their pagan deities. And it is this same spiritual influence which is then passed down from grandmasters, masters, and disciples to their students. Most people in the Western Hemisphere fail to realize the strong roles and family ties which are prevalent in the Eastern cultures. A grand master or founder is known as Sijo or Soki, and this title declares him to be the head of family in an order style. Therefore, when a student joins a school, they are taught, through both example and instruction, to yield the highest honor, respect, and obedience to the head of their martial clan. When a master decides to teach a disciple, he not only takes on the role of a teacher, but also assumes the role of a parent. Chinese people hold teachers in very high regard. To begin, every student submits unquestionably to their teacher. They must be willing to empty their cup of any previous misconceptions and to accept the new teachings, no matter how disruptive they may be to their personal worldview. This is just one reason why it is important to begin with a good teacher. Submission is often represented symbolically by the simple ceremony of bowing to the teacher. Whether to the instructor in the dojo or to that man's master, it is considered the highest disrespect to fail to obey any given instruction by this man. A failure to comply in the traditional arts often even in lifestyle, is frowned upon and will hinder the student's progress in training and the promotion of rank. And, as each student surrenders their will in obedience to their sensei or sifu, these masters, in turn, also bow in homage before the Grand Master and images of the style's founder, each one surrendering their will in order to achieve greater skill and inspiration in their art and a higher position on the steps of the pyramid. A spiritual hierarchy in the martial arts. Every stone set one upon another, and every rung in the ladder is achieved by exalting self above others. Every student and disciple bowing in reverence and submission to the masters above, and each one of these bowing to the man enthroned upon the mountain summit. For the Lord Jesus Christ says, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. To whom you yield yourself, servants to obey, his slaves ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness and life. And so it is that as men listen to the voice of the great deceiver, and yield their bodies as servants to obey him, it is then that they become pawns in the hands of one they do not see. They become the habitation of devils and slaves to darkness and sin. Yi 
each and every master, regardless of the error or the place, heard the call and attained harmony with heaven and earth. There are many paths leading to the top of Mount Fuji, but there is only one summit. The divine is not something above us. It is in heaven. It is in the earth. It is inside us. The art of peace, I practice, has room for each of the world's eight million gods, and I cooperate with them all. So to whom does this man, the abbot and head of Shaolin Temple, bow and pay homage? And of whom are the figures and images which surround him? It is they, the fallen ones, the image of those angels cast down out of heaven by the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom this man receives his power and abilities. And what is the sanctuary where this man worships before his pagan deities? The figures which you now see are those found in a shrine known at the Shaolin Temple as Mahavari, or the Hall of the Three Buddhas. It is here that the temple monks direct their worship. But who is the central figure? And what is the symbolic gesture which we see formed by his right hand? Why do we see the very same symbols which are associated with Wicca, black magic, secret societies, and even the rock and roll industry also being displayed with Hindu, Buddhist, and Taoist idols, some dating back more than a thousand years? Is there a connection? Are the same spirits which work behind the scenes in one also influencing the other? And who is the bearded figure which we see standing at his far outer right? His name is Bodhidharma, or Dao Mo, which in Chinese literally means hairy devil. He is the patron saint of the Shaolin Temple and Chan Buddhism. He is also the 28th in a long lineage of disciples and teachers springing from the founder of the Hindu Buddhist religion. Bodhidharma brought his revised version of Hinduism from India to China in the year 464 AD and legend tells us that it was he who taught the monks of Shaolin Temple the methods of physical movement combined with meditation to enhance their spiritual abilities. Through Hindu breathing exercises and yoga, mantra chanting, visualization techniques, and kata, the monks were said to develop almost supernatural psychic and physical powers. So we see that it was not the strict diet of rice and vegetables which gave rise to the Shaolin monks' notoriety in the world of combative arts. Neither is it simply due to their rigorous training regime that these Buddhist warriors and their temple are known as the world's birthplace and source of all martial styles. But their unique abilities are credited to a more elusive and spiritual power something working subtly in the things they were taught by this Hindu priest. After his death, legend has it that the monks of Shaolin found a set of writings that were left hidden within the temple wall or his tomb, in which he gave detailed yet cryptic instructions written in his own native Sanskrit tongue on the way and its power, exercises which would enable the masters and their future disciples to reach nirvana and enlightenment. It is these writings, known as the muscle tendon changing, marrow brainwashing classics, which are revered among martial artists worldwide, and it is these which form the foundation of all modern martial forms, kata, qigong, and training. There are many who begin training in these Eastern arts and say they will practice only the physical disciplines, laying their Eastern spiritual influences to the side. But according to the founders, grandmasters, and gurus of these arts, this is not only impossible, but futile in its attempt. It verily cannot be done. When an old man is able to defeat many attackers, how could it be due to his strength? We live in two realms, two dimensions, the spiritual and the material. So, to live an effective life, both aspects must be addressed. The spiritual contains the real power, but the natural is the trigger to release it. The two must work in harmony. One of the greatest gifts of the martial arts is that they ultimately guide us to new levels of spirituality. Always more vital to karate, 
than techniques or strength is the spiritual element that lets you move and act with complete freedom. In striving to enter the proper frame of mind, Zen meditation is of great importance. The man who wants to walk the way of karate cannot afford to neglect Zen and spiritual training. But what saith the Word of God? Blessed are the undefiled in the way, those who walk in the law of the Lord. So how are these men claiming to serve Jehovah and yet walking after the steps of another master? Spiritual development is paramount. Technical skills are merely a means to the end. You may train for a long time, but if you merely move your hands and feet and jump up and down like a puppet, learning karate is not very different from learning a dance. You will never reach the heart of the matter. You will have failed to grasp the quintessence of karate do. Quintessence, an interesting word, the fifth and highest element in ancient and medieval philosophy. That is said to permeate all nature and all matter and is the substance composing all celestial bodies. In physics, it is the hypothetical form of dark energy, the fifth fundamental force, the fifth element. And by the ancient Greeks, it was this force which was thought to fill the universe and hold and bind all things together. Are we not hearing echoes of this same philosophy in the media and films today? For my ally, is the force, and the powerful ally it is. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings so we, not this crude matter. You must feel the force around you, here, between you, me, the tree, the rock. Everywhere, yes, and even between the land and the ship. It is this elusive spiritual energy which the Taoist and Buddhist priests spend their lives seeking to invoke and harness. Are these mystical abilities only the figment of the imaginations of Hollywood? Are they not mere fantasy and make-believe? But we must remember that fiction often lies closest to the path of truth else it has no power to deceive. Since the beginning of Earth's history, Satan, that old serpent, has told mankind that we have within ourselves the very powers of divinity, that we need look no further nor higher than our own mind and consciousness for the wisdom and powers of a God, and that through the joining of light with darkness and partaking of that forbidden tree, mankind may complete the final step of his evolution into godhood. But the devil is a liar and the father of all lies, for it is through the ministration of fallen angels that all these miraculous feats of strength and skill are achieved. And it is for this purpose alone that the devil entices men, women, and even little children to compromise with evil, and thus opening the doors wide to the power and influence of the forces of darkness. The Hindu gurus have a word for this merging of flesh with spirit. It is called avatar and literally means the manifestation of the fallen ones or those which came down from the heavens. Is this just coincidence that a major film production was recently released by the same title? And is this the reason we see such a barrage of mystical teachings and terminology in the media updates today? Is Satan preparing mankind for the coming of his final and greatest deception, one which the scriptures declare will, if possible, deceive even the very elect, with all power, signs, and lying wonders? The magicians of heathen times have their counterpart in the mediums, the clairvoyants, and the fortune tellers of today. Could the veil be lifted from before our eyes? We should see evil angels employing all their arts to deceive and to destroy. I saw the rapidity with which this delusion of spiritualism was spreading. A train of cars was shown me, going with the speed of lightning. The angel bade me, look carefully, look carefully. As I fixed my eyes upon the train, it seemed that the whole world was on board. Then he showed me the conductor, 
a fair, stately person whom all the passengers looked up to in reverence. I was perplexed and asked who it was. He said, it is Satan. He is the conductor in the form of an angel of light, and he has taken the world captive. They have been given over to strong delusions to believe a lie, and they are heading with lightning speed to perdition. This delusion will spread, and we all shall have to contend with it face to face, and unless we are prepared for it, we shall be ensnared and overcome. The people of God must be prepared to withstand these lying spirits with the truths from the Word of God. Yoga, to yoke or to join in union with the Hindu gods. Through the martial arts, Tai Chi and yoga, a door is being opened for the introduction and the acceptance of many mystical practices. When women come together and you let go of the judgment and you just be together as women and breathe together as women, uh, truths come out, ritual happens, connection. Yoga is the state where you are needing nothing, where you feel whole and complete. I would say it will save your life. It will change your life. It will make you so much more accepting of yourself. Yoga has, in the last few years, really exploded for Americans. A lot of folks swear by it. Some Christians, though, believe there's actually a real problem with yoga. Mike Galano is here with today's Get to the Point segment, where you bring us these hot-button topics dealing with morals, faith, values. What do we have here? All right, let's find out. Eric had mentioned it's big. 17 million of you out there uh, practice yoga. But again, Eric had mentioned it. Some Christians, one in particular, says a Christian should not do yoga. He's Pastor John MacArthur. He is pastor of Grace Community Church, uh, also host of the radio show Grace to You. He joins us now. Uh, bottom line, uh, basically, you can't get the physical benefits without incorporating the spiritual roots of yoga. We'll talk with uh, John MacArthur in just a minute. Also joining us, a pastor who completely disagrees and says, hey, doing yoga is okay. Doug Padgett, uh, his church in Minneapolis, actually offers a class in yoga. But let's start with you, John MacArthur. All right, let's say I do decide to try yoga, head to the local gym, give it a shot. What am I opening myself up to spiritually that could go against my Christian faith? Well, that would depend on how the yoga is conducted. Uh, if it's just purely exercise and you're a strong Christian, probably wouldn't have any impact on your faith. But in the big picture, why would Christians want to borrow an expression from a false religion, uh, from pantheism. God is everything, you're God, everything is God. When we believe there's only one true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, why would we need to import that? If you want to exercise, exercise, but why borrow a term that has been part of a false religion for centuries? Doug Pangel, let's get you in on this. And, and as we do, I want to read sure. the definition from Webster's on uh, yoga. It, it says it's a Hindu theistic philosophy teaching the suppression of all activity of body mind and will in order that the self may realize its distinction from men and attain liberation kind of tough one to decipher but on a on a spiritual front for a christian right. that does not sound like christ-centered faith to me on the surface of that definition what's going on here help us out well for people who, for, who perform yoga what they're normally trying to do is to find a whole and complete and healed life so when people participate in yoga, most of them aren't on some kind of a yoga agenda. What they're trying to do is use whatever practices they can find that would help them have a whole and complete life. And for a Christian, that's certainly what we're after. The, the Jesus agenda is a whole life, is a complete life, is a healed life. So when people use it to relieve stress, to be healthy in their relationships, to feel good in their body, that's a really good thing. Is all yoga bad yoga for the Christian? Well, let, let me just respond to what, what I've been hearing. Uh, that doesn't sound anything like Christianity. If you want a whole life, if you want your life to be what it should be, you don't put yourself in some weird physical position, empty your mind, center on yourself, and find a try to relieve your stress. You go to the Word of God, to the Gospel of Jesus Christ. You embrace in faith the sacrifice of Christ and His death and resurrection as your Savior and Redeemer. God comes, regenerates you, transforms your life, makes you a new creation, and you're saved and you're on your way to heaven, and you can live a life of peace and joy. That's the promise of the Gospel. That there is no contribution made to that by any physical position or any kind of 
uh, meditation. The idea of Christianity is to fill your mind with biblical truth and focus on the God who is above you. That's Christian worship. The idea of yoga is to fill your mind with nothing except to focus on yourself and try to find the God that is inside of you. From a Christian viewpoint, that's a false religion. And it is the goal of all yoga practice regardless of name or methodology, to relax the body, to open the mind and let down the guard. And it is that which the Hindu yogis call the great serpent spirit. According to ancient Hindu texts, this spirit lives within every human being from birth, thus inviting this spirit to awaken from its coiled slumber below the navel and climb the spiraled staircase to the throne of the human will a throne which is said to reside at the third eye or frontal lobe of the human mind. Within every human lies a divine cosmic energy called Kundalini. Almost every tradition speaks of it in one form or another. In Japanese it is called Qi. In Chinese it is called Qi. The scriptures of Christianity call it the Holy Spirit. What is Kundalini? It is the power of the self, the power of consciousness. Kundalini is Shakti, the supreme energy whom the sages of India worship as the mother of the universe. It is only when the Kundalini is awakened that we become aware of our true nature, of our greatness, of the fact that not only do we belong to God, but we are God. When one acquires the strength of Kundalini, one no longer remains a bound, limited creature. One achieves total union with God. But which God are they speaking of? To it, I don't think that there's a way to kind of close your world again. Once it's opened, it's open. One of the wonderful things about yoga as a practice is that we really become connected to our authentic self. You go back to the mat every day because it's a practice and you want to see the miracles unfold and every so often in a physical pose and asana, you'll breathe in and suddenly everything will be clear. People are trying constantly to find peace, to find their power, to find inspiration, their own inner beauty. It's no coincidence that yoga is really popular today because the world needs yoga right now. The reason why so many people practice yoga is because it tastes good. <laughs> Thus the martial artist and yoga practitioner is said to achieve enlightenment and nirvana, beginning the path to immortal life. But this is that same lie which the ancient serpent spoke to Eve in the Garden of Eden. Thus saying, that by faithless disobedience and rebellion to the word of Jehovah and partaking of that forbidden fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, ye shall not surely die, but ye shall be as gods. Satan wove an elaborate web of deception, twisting and distorting the word of Yahweh. And today the very same lie is being spoken through the senseis, gurus, masters and instructors of the Eastern mystical arts. Taste and see, they say, for in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing both light and darkness, good and evil. Is this the enlightenment which Jesus lived, suffered and died to give his people? Is this that mystery which he rose again from the dead the third day to freely impart? Now I beseech you, brethren, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. This is the ultimate purpose of the Eastern mystical arts, the joining and merging of humanity with the forces of darkness. Millions are being deceived by the ancient dragon as they are told that we are on the brink of the final evolution of mankind. And in this final step, we will achieve godhood. As man is delving into the occult practices of the Eastern religions, in his effort to see beyond the veil of our physical world, the doorway is being opened to spiritual forces and powers of which the Bible has warned us in no uncertain terms. Spiritualism takes many forms in the Eastern arts. 
But all of these, regardless of how they are clothed, are but the working of demons upon the human mind. The Greek word for sorcery is a magician or an oriental scientist. Do we not hear many of these occult skills now falsely being called science? Although these esoteric skills were once reserved for only those who had spent their lives in the dark arts, now in the end of this age, when the powers of darkness see that time has almost run out, the dragon is working to make these abilities not only desirable, but available to all who are willing to yield to his voice and take that step onto enchanted ground. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Israel. Thus saith Jehovah, Learn not the ways of the heathen, and be not intrigued by the signs of the heavens, for the heathen are dismayed at them. Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of these heathen nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination to foretell the future, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, a hypnotist, or a consulter with familiar spirits, nor a wizard, or a necromancer, one who speaks with the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord Yahweh. Practices which are rooted in the pagan religions of the Far East are now becoming popular among health and medical communities, which claim to be healing rather than combative in nature. And that which was once called witchcraft only 50 years ago is now being widely accepted as an alternative form of medicine. Cloaked in garments of pseudo-scientific terminology, many health food stores chiropractors, and even Western medical doctors are now incorporating traditional Chinese medicine and ancient Hindu healing techniques as part of their practice. Acupuncture, acupressure, Ayurveda, iridology, energetic kinesiology, reflexology, magnetism, and hypnosis are now being recommended as a safe means to recovering and maintaining health but we would do well in taking heed to Jehovah's instructions to avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science which are falsely so called. Today, many Christians are turning back to Egypt in seeking relief from pain and physical disease rather than simply seeking help from the word of the living God. The mysteries of heathen worship are being replaced by secret associations and seances the obscurities and wonders of spiritualistic mediums, and the disclosures of these mediums is being eagerly received by thousands who refuse to accept light from God's Word. Believers in spiritualism may speak with scorn of the magicians of old, but the great deceiver laughs in triumph as they yield to his arts under a different or more modern form. The apostles and followers of nearly all forms of spiritism claim to have power to cure disease. They attribute their powers to electricity, magnetism, the so-called sympathetic remedies, or to the latent forces within the mind of man. There are many who shrink with horror from the thought of consulting spirit mediums, but who are attracted by the more pleasing forms of spiritism, forms such as the Emmanuel movement, Christian science, theosophy, and other oriental religions. Through a flood of spiritualistic teachings from Hollywood and the printed page, Satan is working in this final generation with a fierceness such as never before. The dragon is fighting to blind the eyes and the minds of all mankind so that we might not see and comprehend the glad tidings of Christ, which is, according to the scriptures, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Working through infiltration rather than by a direct frontal attack, millions are now being swept away into a religion which requires no blood atonement, no cross, no personal sacrifice, no death to self, the world, or their flesh. For if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not 
lest the light and the revealing of the glorious glad tidings of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So it will be in the great final conflict between righteousness and sin. While new life, light, and power are descending from on high in the latter reign upon the disciples of Christ, a strange force is springing up from beneath and energizing the agencies of Satan. Intensity is taking possession of every earthly element, and with a subtlety gained through centuries of conflict, the prince of evil works under a disguise. He now manifests himself clothed as an angel of light. In the days of Christ, the leaders and teachers of Israel were powerless to resist the work of Satan, for they were neglecting the only means by which they could have withstood the evil spirits. For it was by the word of God that Christ overcame the wicked one, and it is by his word that we also are to overcome. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives even unto death. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with his mouth profession is made unto salvation. The leaders of Israel professed to be the expositors of God's word, but they had studied it only to sustain their traditions. By their interpretation, they made God's word express sentiments that God had never given. Their mystical construction made indistinct that which the Lord had made plain. They disputed over insignificant technicalities and practically denied the most essential truths. And thus infidelity and the seeds of doubt were scattered everywhere. God's word was robbed of its power and evil spirits worked their will. Today, history is repeating with the Bible open before them and professing to reverence its teachings. Many of the religious leaders of our time are destroying faith in it as the word of God. They busy themselves with dissecting the word setting their own opinions above its plainest statements. In their hands, God's Word loses its regenerating power, and this is why infidelity runs riot and iniquity grows so widespread. And so it is that when Satan has undermined faith in the Bible, he then directs men to other sources for light and power. Thus he insinuates himself. Those who turn from the plain teaching of Scripture and the convicting power of God's Holy Spirit are thus inviting the control of demons. Criticism and speculation concerning the Scriptures have opened the way for spiritism and theosophy, those modernized forms of ancient heathenism, to gain a foothold even in the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. For side by side with the preaching of the gospel, agencies are working which are but the medium of lying spirits. Many a man tampers with these merely from curiosity, but seeing evidence of the working of a more than human power, he is lured on and on until he is controlled by a will stronger than his own. Many church leaders of every denomination are now being trained in what is called spiritual formation, practices which have been taken from the works of Eastern mystics and Ignatius Loyola. And these men are now leading our churches in the acceptance of an emerging new form of Christianity. Through the practices of Lecto Divina, contemplative prayer, centering prayer, meditation, spiritual drumming, and other ancient spiritual exercises. For me, Zazen is prayer. To come into the presence of mystery and sit with attention, I mean, attention, reverence, gratitude, need not be spoken. We don't have to use the words. What would I do with words? Would I try to remind God of something God forgot? When you can really be mindful of this present moment and recognizing that its depth, its mystery, is deeper than any thought you have, than any feeling that you have, it's hard to find words for this. That's when you feel that you are held, that you are sustained, that what you really are is deeper than what you think you are or than anything anybody says you are. It's deeper.
And that reality is the Christ spirit. That reality is our Buddha nature. That's who I really am. Many honest Christians are now being led into the snare of that old serpent and the apostasy foretold by the Holy Scriptures in these last days. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. But this know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I tell you, from such turn away. All of these practices are deeply rooted in the occult philosophies of Asia's three primary religions. And each of these religions share five common principles or doctrines. The first being the doctrine of reincarnation and the immortality of the soul. The second is pantheism, the teaching that God is an energy or force which resides within all matter. The third is known as the principle of the divine spark, or the godhood of all mankind, waiting to be revealed through pagan and occult initiation. The fourth principle is the doctrine of evolution, the teaching that mankind is only a higher form of animal, not created in the likeness of God, but in that of the brute beast, and now slowly evolving through spiritual exercises into godhood. And the fifth and most fundamental of all is that principle of yin and yang, the belief of the dualistic nature of all things, that there are no absolutes, and each of these five teachings stand in direct opposition to a clear, thus saith the Lord. Today there are coming into educational institutions and churches everywhere spiritualistic teachings that undermine faith in God and in His Word. The theory that God is an essence, an energy or force pervading all nature is now being received by many who profess to believe the scriptures. But however beautifully clothed, this theory is a most dangerous deception. It misrepresents Jehovah and is a dishonor to His greatness and majesty. It tends not only to mislead, but to debase men, for darkness is its element and sensuality its sphere. The result of accepting this philosophy is separation from God, and to fall in human nature, this means ruin. These spiritualistic theories concerning God make His grace and divine influence of no effect. For if God is an essence which pervades all nature, then He dwells in all men. And in order to attain holiness, man has only to develop the power within himself. These theories, if followed to their logical conclusion, sweep away the entire plan of salvation. They do away with the necessity for the atonement, and they make man his own savior. These theories regarding God make His word of no effect, and those who accept them are in great danger of being finally led to look upon the whole Bible as a fiction. The spiritual exercises of Ignatius resound with almost identical philosophies as those of the Hindu, Taoist, and Buddhist religions. The occult principles of his writings are being taught not only in yoga and Tai Chi classes, but now also in many contemporary spiritual retreats, as well as spiritual formation and emergent church leadership programs. It should come, therefore, as no surprise that the Roman Church has even recognized Buddha as one of her own, under the name Saint Josephat. For the word Catholic literally means universal, and as the universal church, she welcomes with open arms all religious beliefs into her fold, so long as they recognize the Roman pontiff as the highest spiritual authority upon this earth. So what is the purpose in gathering into one all the religions of the world? And how is the art of war being used to promote a thousand years of peace? And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the apostasy has come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall arise. And his strength shall be mighty, but not by his own power. For the dragon shall give him his power and his throne and great authority. And he shall destroy marvelously through signs and wonders 
and shall prosper and shall accomplish. And he shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his knowledge also he shall cause craft, treachery, subtlety, and deceit to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace he shall destroy many. Church members love that which the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. Papists who boast themselves of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power. And Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth and faith in the Word of God, will also be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings alike will accept the form of godliness without the power, and they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennia. And what is this message which is to prepare mankind for a coming new age of peace? In order to have world harmony, all mankind must acknowledge equality of all faiths. One cannot be said to be better or worse than another. Neither can one be said to hold the truth and all others be in error. All the religious leaders and founders of every age must be recognized and acknowledged as divinely inspired and all influenced by that same spirit. Are we seeing this happen in the media today? When I was 10 years old, uh, I asked my mother, I said, well, there's only one God, why are there so many religions? And over the years, I've been pondering that question ever since, and it would seem to me that the conclusion I've come to is that all the religions are true. They just see a different part of the elephant. According to the Grand Masters and the founders of the Eastern Arts, the ultimate purpose of all martial systems is peace. First, it is said, by creating peace or harmony between heaven and earth within the man, and then in creating peace between all of mankind. With the crisis facing our world today, through continued and ever larger natural disasters, the crumbling of financial empires, epidemic outbreaks of disease and plague, bloodshed, famine, and war. Humanity is searching, desperately searching for an answer to this world's dilemma, a solution to the world's calamities, a safety in the coming storm, a savior, if you will, to lead all mankind into a thousand years of peace. And just such a being will appear, one who is clothed in light and manifest himself with miraculous powers of reconciliation, healing, and peace. He has been expected for generations by all of the major religions. Christians know him as the Christ and expect his imminent return. Jews await him as the Messiah. Hindus look for the coming of Krishna. Buddhists expect him as Maitreya Buddha. And Muslims anticipate the Imman Mahadi. Although the names are different, many believe they all refer to the same individual, the world teacher, whose personal name is Maitreya. World peace must develop from inner peace. Peace is not just the absence of violence. Peace is the manifestation of human compassion. The very name Maitri means loving kindness. In today's world, we really need Matri, Matreya, loving kindness. Are these just the sentiments of a few New Age mystics? Or is there a spirit working behind the scenes to bring all the world together as one? 1997 in Washington, D.C., Dr. Sung Young Moon established the Martial Arts Federation for World Peace for the purpose of building world peace by encouraging all martial artists to work together. It has tried to transcend all differences that exist between people who practice martial arts. The Federation respects all martial arts and is dedicated to bringing about unity and cooperation for a bigger purpose, namely world peace. 
Since war begins in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that defenses of peace must be constructed. From my own personal training and experience, I think the first steps toward world peace is personal peace. One thing about this organization that I find very interesting is its emphasis on the concept of creating a moral society, a strong society. Because of my experience in Asia, the original martial arts were formed for the purpose of creating a safe and stable society. The martial arts are truly a unifying force in our troubled world today. Aside from religion itself, the martial arts comprise the one philosophy which brings the inner goodness and strength that everyone possesses to the surface, both in one's own life and to inspire the best in others. Why can't all the people of the planet live together in harmony? I just don't know. There have been three big walls that have caused wars throughout history. They are national, religious, and racial walls. The day the people of the world agree to construct one universal country, one universal religion, and one universal human race, by everyone becoming colorblind, everyone on this planet will be happy with every breath of life. It is interesting to note that in order to obtain peace, these men practice fighting. And in order to gain harmony within, the martial arts teach combat, domination, pride, and control. However, if we practice fighting in order not to fight, if we practice striking in order to develop self-control, if we practice retaliation in order not to retaliate, there is something terribly wrong with our spiritual worldview. This is exactly the product of the Eastern Taoist, Buddhist, and Hindu philosophies, the fruit of that forbidden tree. For light becomes darkness, error becomes truth, and that which is declared as evil by the word of Jehovah is now looked upon as being good. The teachings and doctrines and practices of the martial arts, Tai Chi and Yoga, are in direct opposition to the word of God. And through these arts, man is being led into rebellion against his Creator by transgression of God's holy law and his instructions in righteousness. We are bringing upon ourselves and all the world the sure results of our own arrogance and pride. Humanity, under the influence of that great serpent, the devil, is striving to revive the ancient empire of the sun and under global cooperation to rebuild a temple to the gods and place upon its throne a new world leader, a teacher who will guide all mankind into a thousand years of peace. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, security, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. This end of an age inevitably produces a certain number of natural disasters, such as floods and earthquakes, and we are seeing a dramatic climax in the number of disasters taking place around the world. Maitreya says, the last time I came as Jesus, it was written in the Bible that when I appeared again, the very elements of nature would be disturbed. After the disasters have peaked, there will come a period of calm. The violence and destruction will come to an end. As people gain awareness, their guilt will recede. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk then and live as children of the light. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day of the Lord shall not come, except there come a falling away, an apostasy first, and that man of sin, the transgressor of Jehovah's law, be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, 
showing himself that he is God. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hands of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. Is yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodists signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement. And under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. As spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of our day, it has greater power to deceive and to ensnare. Satan himself is converted, and after the modern order of things, he will appear as an angel of light. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the Roman Church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. Woo! I told you you'd never forget it. Ha 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 ha
which will take the whole world as an overwhelming surprise. But today, the door of mercy is still open, and the Lord is calling to every man, woman, and child, if ye will only hear His voice, He is saying, My son, my daughter, give me your heart. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord.